Thank you. Uh, I've really uh, enjoyed this meeting. So this is thanks uh, not just to the organizers, but also to the participants. I've really learned a lot from the participants and the speakers, and I've been inspired. And uh, hopefully this will, will show. And I, I also want to thank all of these, uh, this community of this ecosystem that's helping us bring technology into the communities um, and into the real world. And I want to tie together a bunch of themes that I've heard throughout the meeting about education and about uh, community and so forth, and, uh, and ask what it is that inspires us to participate in the community, and what, it what, what kind of risks do we, what should we be taking? And of course, this is the sort of thing that that's inspired my generation of scientists and engineers was Apollo 11. And we've heard from Tony about how they're getting volunteers all over the world to help them mine uh, data from um, uh, galaxies. John Rogers told us about getting people, communities, and families involved in do-it-yourself cars. It sounds pretty complicated. And Luis mentioned about how we can uh, interpret ancient texts. And all of these things are, are quite uh, amazing. But what topic are we really all the best experts of the world on? We're pretty good at those three things. But what would be the best thing? What do we know the most about, more than any scientist? and it's ourselves. So what can we do about that? How can we harness that? And I've been a little obsessed about bringing down the cost, because I think that's part of the deal. Uh, for about the last 32 years, I've obsessed on this. And we brought the price down a little bit um, from about the, uh, $3 billion for the, which would, be, which would have bought a uh, pretty big, tallest building in the world in Dubai. We bought one kind of pathetic genome, uh, generic human genome. And, uh, and then the price has come down to where it's in the couple thousand dollars this year. And I have the last point being pennies. And, and, uh, and you'll see what I mean by that in just, uh, in just a second here. We're shrinking your genome. This is the six billion base pairs, three billion you got from your mother, and three from your father, three billion from your father. All of the genes, about 20 some thousand. Now, what does zero dollars to the consumer mean? We have these examples, I'm sure. You've used some of these things. Maybe somebody here has used the World Wide Web by now, um, or Wikipedia, very trustworthy source. Uh, uh, Street View, this is actually where we are, um, not real time, um, and so forth. The, the, these are crowdsourcing and so forth, and that, I think that's something we'd like to uh, harness. So when we create a community, if you just have your you know, your giant cell phone, uh, like uh, Mike Douglas here, uh, and you don't share it, and there's nobody else to share it with, then it's not too useful. Same thing for fax or, the f or furly PCs. So if we all have our genomes, because the price has come down, we need more than that. We need to do some sharing. This is an open question. I don't pretend that I'm going to answer it tonight. But we stand at a point where we don't know what the social standards are going to be. Are we going to treat genomes like faces, or are we going to treat them like something um, pathologically scary? Um, our faces are actually something that might be worth hiding, in the sense that they reveal a great deal about you. Your ancestry, which can be held against you, your emotions, your health, the state of your health at that moment. But the tendency is that we share it, and we're sort of expected to share our, our faces. We don't cover them up. Openness has changed since I was young, since many of us were young. Uh, we didn't talk about our salaries. We didn't, but now it's required by law for many of us. Uh, sexuality was mostly off the, uh, was not something you talked about in polite society. Even cancer was something that you, that if somebody in the family had it, you hid from it. Uh, Facebook, this is a Facebook generation, um, but it's affecting not, people are putting their faces on a, attaching it to incredible at faces and names attaching to incredible things, like patientslikeme.com, which my good friend Jamie Haywood and his family put together. People who have HIV AIDS or neurodegenerative diseases or serious psychiatric problems for the good of their community and other people in the world who have these similar uh, diseases, they're putting all the information that they have available, including their identity. So this is not for everybody, but it, I see a trend here. Um, I think uh, 
the legislative and executive branches saw a trend here too, and the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act was passed in 2008, and it's making people feel a little more comfortable. We don't want to drop our defenses, but it's, a, it's another point to telling insurers and employers don't discriminate because everybody's watching. So uh, you could go out and get your 10-year-old uh, kid, uh, their first DNA uh, kit, this, this advertisement claims, so they can do innocent things like determine who their father is and, uh, <laughs> and their friends' fathers and all the rest. Um, and so we have this, this issue about anonymity versus open access um, in the regular world and in research. And so, for example, you can identify the governor of, of Massachusetts with open source records. Not just the DNA is identifying like this, the CODIS here that you use for, uh, you probably see it on CSI, but many of the traits that you look at are also identifying. My favorite one is number five here with a 15-year-old kid was unsatisfied with the state of affairs that he was the product of an anonymous sperm donor where the, the fertility clinic had done everything they could to protect this guy's identity. Kid took a simple you know, piece of uh, saliva, sent it to, uh, to a standard ancestry, DNA ancestry test, found his surname, found his father on the first shot, and just showed up without phoning and said, hi, dad. So, <laughs> so not necessarily everybody is up to the speed of 15-year-olds, but uh, there are plenty of 15-year-olds around that can do this. And there's abandoned DNA and so forth. So who can contribute to this cure, new cures and new preventatives such that, that Dean was talking about, some of the ones that we have as legacy, is growing very, very rapidly. Just like that plunging cost in genomics, there are many other things uh, in medicine which are improving. Um, and these are some of my heroes. People like Augusto Odoni, which, uh, uh, go figure, Hollywood managed to make uh, lipid biochemistry into a blockbuster with Nick Nolte and Susan Sarandon. Um, my, my student here, Kay All, is, uh, her family has hemochromatosis, HFE. Uh, we've got members of the community. I've already mentioned Jamie Haywood and his family who had uh, um, uh, ALS, unfortunately. And they are motivating donating, raising consciousness, they're doing what they can, even though none of these people uh, were classical clinical geneticists or even uh, medical researchers, they were engineers, uh, financial, um, and so forth. So we have this project, some of you may have heard of it, called the Personal Genome Project, which looks at genes, environments, and traits. It's not just about genes to traits, Environments plays a big role. We're not telling you uh, this is your genetics, get used to it. It's more a matter of this is the way your genetics and your environment interact. This is what you can do to change your lifestyle, your drugs, and so forth, just like Dean was saying. But, we need, but there's a lot we need to learn, and we need to have people who are willing you know, to share both their genetics and their traits. So uh, this is the first and still the only open access uh, database for, the, for this combination. It's uh, remarkable. Uh, I wish there were more. Uh, we'd love to have the competition. There are starting to be some branches of this um, worldwide, but this is very uniquely an American operation, both that dropping cost in genomics where we've dropped by a million fold since 2003, and this project are American in the theme of uh, reimagining America. Um, we do this, we have this project that is open access data because we're not sure who is going to be, make the breakthrough. Just, we heard earlier, uh, just a uh, earlier talk about how it's the outsiders that often make uh, that breakthrough and we want to enable that. And we do this by over, avoiding over promising on the de-identification side. We have plenty of volunteers that get it, that uh, uh, don't think that this is the riskiest thing that, that they're gonna do in their life. Uh, we do require that they get 100% on an exam, not just pass it, uh, in order that they know, they and their family know that they're getting what they're getting into and they can convince us of that. And, that, and if we discover something about later th th that we'd like to report back to them that they have this particular highly predictive and actionable genetic disease, we don't want them to tell us at that point, 
oh, I, you know, I didn't want to know that, uh, or my family didn't want to know that. So educate before they get involved in the, pro in the project. We're doing whole genome sequences. It's very different from doing a little piece of the genome. It's, uh, I don't have time to go into the details, but it is amazing that we can now do whole genome sequences for individuals, and we're doing that as we go along. We're establishing stem cell lines, and we're sharing them. Now, these are, you can think of these like the cord blood cells that some people make for their babies. Well, these are stem cell lines for the adults. And the numbers on each, on each of these uh, individuals is the number that people internationally are using to order the stem cell lines that correspond to each of these individuals. We have institutional review board approval. We've been working on this for about four years now. We, we have approval to scale up to 100,000 people. If that goes well, we'll go beyond that. We already have 15,000 since May of this year. It's really remarkable how many people are excited about this project. And I think the main complaint is, you know, where's my genome? <laughs> so uh, personalgenomes.org if you're interested. So here comes the confessions, okay. I took this, uh, <clears throat> I'm a mutant. Uh, before I tell you all my mutations, and these involve environmental components and lifestyle components, as Dean said. Um, my mutation is not that I'm dangerously attractive, uh, as you can probably tell. What I have is heart problems, three independent ones as far as I know. And these are actual problems. These are not theoretical from my DNA sequence. Uh, I have, I had cholesterol getting close to 300, higher than the guy in Dean's video, and it's now uh, normal due to a vegan diet and lovastatin. Uh, I had an, an infarction that had nothing to do with that cholesterol. I had absolutely clean arteries by angiography, and I could go through the list. I, I uh, haven't fallen asleep yet during this talk, but I, uh, I might, and you'll know why. And uh, these kind of uh, uh, problems that I have in my mind uh, don't, make, don't make myself and, you know, my other family members real popular with the teachers, um, but we make it through anyway. Uh, and long femur syndrome is not, is not humorous. Uh, it, it's, some, it's sometimes called uh, don't, don't fit in opera chairs. Okay. So you can get generic health advice. And this used to be what you would get because it's easy to deliver, uh, it's easy to write books about and so forth. And these would be things like exercise, drink your milk like the guy on the previous slide, uh, got milk, uh, eat your green beans and your grains and your iron and get more rest. Unless you've got hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, in which case you'll drop dead during exercise if you don't know about it. Uh, if you have lactose intolerance or high cholesterol, maybe you should uh, consider having lactose minus and cholesterol minus milk. Don't eat fava beans if you have G6PD problems like 400 million people in the world have this problem, um, and so forth. Again, on the line, there's, there's a hemochromatosis uh, that I mentioned before and narcolepsy. G6PD, why, is this, why are there so many mutations? Why do we have 400 million people have this problem? Uh, you can see that people get, people understand in ter uh, maps. They understand their own genetics in terms of traits, their family, and they understand map. And this is where, in, this is inherited. This is, this is inherited from their parents, G6CD. Well, if you look, it, that map corresponds almost perfectly with malaria. And, and there's a known causal relationship, and this is the interaction between your genes and your environment. Um, and they better not take in malarials because that's one of the things, that's one of the foods and drugs that sets off your hemolytic anemia if you have this uh, disease. But you have a natural resistance to malaria, and that's the reason it's so prevalent in these populations. So we are doing this bioweather map. Uh, this is just, uh, you know, taken from AccuWeather map. It's not, it's not an actual uh, bioweather map. But the idea is instead of having a cold front going in, which is intuitively interesting and obvious and, and people get it with weather, um, what if this was actually a cold caused by a rhinovirus or coronavirus or H1 swine flu? They get it. And so we're trying to bring this out as part of the Personal Genome Project. And here are two of my uh, younger colleagues, Mort, Morton Sommer and Gautam Dantas, 
out doing field studies where they're collecting uh, microorganisms in the environment very far away from hospitals and farms where you have a lot of antibiotics and hence antibiotic resistance. And they also did sampling near hospitals and farms and samplings from within human mouth and gut. And this is what they found. Uh, that even far from hospitals and farms, there are many microbes, this is just the, the phylogenetic tree of many microorganisms, that are resistant to one of those drugs that you take. And you don't know which one it is, and what the physician usually says is, try, the, you know, try some ampicillin and come back if you're not dead. Um, but not only were they resistant to a drug, they were resistant to all 18 classes of drugs that we tested. Not only that, not only that, but these particular, this particular way we constructed the study, we could find bacteria that would live on antibiotics as their sole source of food. Okay, they're not only resistant to them, they loved them, they would eat them, and they would eat them at 50 times higher than the clinical dose that you normally have. So there's a lot of stuff out there. The good news I don't have time to go into is we have ways now of leveraging this and treating. So what inspires us to participate? What is it that you're willing to take risks and be volunteers, be part of a community that's actually trying to put together, now that we have brought down the price of this technology by a million fold, um, how, does it, how do we go from the same way with personal computers where it wasn't really clear what we did with computer, personal computers when they came, first came out? So, um, I've shown this before, but the point is who can contribute to cures and preventions by motivating, donating, contributing your time, raising consciousness in your family, in your community, the answer is you. You're the one that can do it. And really, this is not something that scientists can do all by themselves. They can't go out and order a chemical and work in their lab for 30 years without you and your uh, family and colleagues. So think of this kind of like a walkathon. Some of, the, some of you will be walking, and some of you will be cheerleading in various ways. So thank you very much. <laughs>